We're up uh, just over 20. Um, I think we can get going. Uh, it's my real pleasure to have Jen McIntosh back here. Um, she's, uh, she's an old friend. Um, this is not her first rodeo as an environmental breakfast club speaker. Uh, she was supposed to speak last spring in April and uh, mid-March the university closed down going live and we chatted and we said, well, we'll put it off and be able to do it live next year. <laughs> right. So here we are 10 months later and uh, nothing is live on campus except for a few labs and in the law school, a few uh, uh, clinics with live uh, clients. Um, but uh, it's worked pretty well. And I look around the screen and see some uh, friends who are at, in, uh, in distant places being able to join us which probably we should think about doing more once we go back live, which is making it possible for people. Yeah, right. Making it possible for people to join us from, from a distance. Um, Jan, of course, is in the hydrology and atmospheric sciences department and she's a very distinguished professor. Uh, her topic today is where is the bottom of groundwater, which is really an important issue. So I hope I can with a few keystrokes, share the screen. No, that's not what I wanted. Can I make her a co-host? That would help. That would help. Okay, so if we go participants. Robert, if uh... There's a thing called screen share at the bottom. Yeah. And if you uh, click on that, I think you can say multiple uh, people uh, can share. Well, something just came up. So something's yeah. working. Looks like you're sharing your screen, Robert. So if you close this, it right. looks like I'm now a co host. You are a co host. Okay. Yeah, so if you close your, stop sharing your screen, then I should be able to share mine. Up at the top link where it says stop sharing. Stop sharing, okay. You review options. No, that's not, oh, it's down here maybe, huh? Hmm. It should be up at the top if you. Viewing. Hover your mouse over the top. No, all I'm getting is you're viewing the Zoom. Or maybe try to hit escape. You cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing. Okay, that's good. So maybe we can just, oh, they don't want to close out. It's embarrassing that you could see just how incompetent. Green bar at the top. Yes. Nothing's happening, Karen. It won't let you stop sharing. Robert, if you've yeah. already done screen share, you it if you there's a co-host, you could probably sign out and sign back in, and it would cancel your screen share. That's a uh, maybe a, a tool. Yeah. yeah, I've done that before. And the problem, you know, Mark. Oh, there, there we go. go. Okay, oh, Mark is there. Yeah. No one seems to miss me. There we go. Okay, we got it. We're done. All right. Good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. Thanks. Well, I'll go ahead and get started. So thanks again for re-inviting me, Robert. Again, hopefully this is an even better platform to get more discussion. I was excited to give an the chance to talk today because I'm really definitely more on the science side of groundwater. And I'm going to present some um, of our recent results today. And I'm quite interested to talk to the policy folks that are definitely um, have their <laughs> Um, hands and what's happening with groundwater in the state of Arizona in the Southwest. So I look forward to hopefully an active discussion. Got about 25 slides as prompts that I'll go through, but I'm, I'm happy to answer questions along the way. And then hopefully that leaves at least 20 to 30 minutes at the end um, for further discussion. So I'm sure that many folks are already aware of the importance of groundwater. Um, Robert alluded to this, if we look globally, you know, from a recent call to action by a group of not only um, hydrologists as well as policymakers 
to try to bring to attention the importance of groundwater. And I'm just gonna highlight a few things. So for example, a large portion of the world's population is dependent on, out, on groundwater, particularly for irrigated agriculture, which we'll see is a similar story in the state of Arizona. We know already that large extraction of groundwater has impacted surface flows. And one projection is by 2050, the majority of streams could be impacted by the pumping of groundwater. And we know that around 1.7 billion people live above aquifers that are already stressed from overuse. And that all of this groundwater pumping disproportionately hits um, poor population, both in terms of declines in water levels and also in terms of the quality of water that's available for them. So if we turn to looking at a US perspective, there's been some really interesting studies over the last 10 years that have allowed us to look at continental scale groundwater depletion. And this is coming from space. There's two satellites that are called GRACE satellites and they allow us to look at the gravity change of earth, which gives us a sense of how much groundwater storage has either been added in some cases in blue or declined in um, the warm colors in red. and red. Really, if looking at this map, what I hope that you see is that the areas of groundwater decline really correspond to um, many of our large agricultural regions across the western US, um, from the High Plains Aquifer in the central US to the Central Valley of California. And then here we are in the state of Arizona, where we can see steep declines over the last 10 plus years um, because of groundwater pumping. And we know that there's been real impacts from um, extraction of groundwater in the state of Arizona. Um, a couple examples, one from land subsidence or the opening of fissures that's happened as you remove water from the subsurface that was holding up the land surface. And we see that land subsidence is still occurring today in places like Cochise County. Another example is as we lower the regional water table from pumping groundwater for irrigated agriculture, that we're starting to see drying out of shallow domestic um, and shallow local farmers' wells. In addition, in Arizona, you know, we've got a long history here with the Santa Cruz River of knowing that we've dried out the river because of groundwater pumping. And there's an interesting story that's just happened um, locally because of stopping groundwater pumping near the Tohono O'odham Nation where the Santa Cruz River has actually been revived because of relaxation of pumping and rising of the water table. So if we dig a little bit further into that satellite data, um, there's several different interesting stories or important stories about groundwater in the state of Arizona and that has taken really different trajectories. So, you know, groundwater has been pumped um, throughout the state going back at least to the 1940s. But this is looking at the change in groundwater storage going back at least to 1980. And I kind of want to point out these two contrasting stories. One is large groundwater decline um, in areas in rural parts of Arizona that are not part of active management areas. So in places where groundwater is unregulated. And an example of that would be in places like Cochise County, where we see large declines in the water table um, because of groundwater pumping. In other areas like in Tucson, you know, we could think of it as a success story in the sense that we had initial groundwater declines that was leading to things like drying out of the Santa Cruz to land subsidence, that we were able to reverse that trajectory because of the Colorado River water that we are storing in places like Avra Valley and using as our drinking water. And so enabling us to turn off a lot of the pumps in the central Tucson well field, which has allowed our regional water table to rebound um, in some cases. And so for example, in the Tucson active management area where there's a lot of groundwater regulation, we can see in blue that there's been relatively little change in the groundwater storage. And again, in some cases we're replenishing groundwater locally, both by not using it as well as by um, reinjecting or infiltrating treated uh, wastewater. 
So again, two very different trajectories for groundwater in Arizona. And what I'm mostly gonna focus on today is the groundwater depletion story. So we're at a crossroads in the Arizona, um, as you all probably know better than I do, um, by two things. One, a revision, hopefully, of our Groundwater Management Act, which is coming to an end, as well as signage of the Colorado River Drought Contingency Plan, um, which I put in this particular picture because of Kirsten Engel. Um, it's too bad that she can't be here today because I was really hoping to hear from Kirsten and Robert and many others of you that, again, are much more involved in what's happening with groundwater policy in the state of Arizona. But the reason why the passage of the Colorado River Drought Contingency Plan is important from my perspective as a groundwater hydrologist is that by decreasing, as we should, our usage of Colorado River water, um, we are turning more to groundwater. So in areas where, um, for example, farmers have been using Colorado River water, they're gonna be turning back to pumping of groundwater and back to those initial issues that I started my talk with. So one of the areas that um, you know, has been in the news a lot has been Cochise County, again, because this is an area of unregulated groundwater extraction and where we've seen these real issues of land subsidence as well as drying of farmers' wells. And there was this great spread in the New York Times a couple of years ago about this issue. But in reading that and then working in the state of Arizona for the past 15 years, you know, some of the questions that have really come to my mind and that my research group has been trying to address is this concept of how deep can we drill for fresh water as we're turning to groundwater or we're already rapidly racing to the bottom of aquifers, you know, what is that depth? At what point are we going to run out of fresh to brackish groundwater that we can use for water supply? What is the quality of that water at depth? Hope to show you today that that's a, an important component of how deep we can drill for water. How quickly will it be replenished? Um, again, because we're rapidly extracting it from the subsurface, it rates faster than nature can resupply to be a key point of my talk. And then finally, at the end of my talk, I wanna get to who's already competing for that water at depth and what are those uses? So to first to try to start to dig into these questions, I just want to start to paint the picture um, about fossil groundwater and the idea that there's been a, several studies over the last four or five years that have really looked at the age of groundwater, you know, at global to local scales. And what they've shown is that the vast majority of groundwater, even at relatively shallow depths, is beyond um, the limits of what we call tritium dating. So what it means is that that water was recharged prior to the 1950s. And so much of that water is what we call fossil. Fossil water is usually thought to be on the order of about thousands to tens of thousands, to some case, millions of years old. So most of the water that we are extracting for, for example, irrigated agriculture is old water. It was recharged some people would argue in a past climate when areas like Arizona were wetter, colder, could have had more precipitation. And just as one example, um, there's been a lot of folks, including my research group and Chris Eastow and others that have gone about dating groundwater across Southern Arizona in all of our alluvial basins. And this is just one example from Cochise County in the Wilcox Basin where I'm not gonna go into the details except to tell you that almost all of the groundwater is on time scales of thousands to tens of thousands of years old, which may sound shocking to the non-geologists on the Zoom, but from a geologic perspective, you know, these again are large aquifer systems, um, have long flow paths, and this is not surprising. And if we look at other aquifer systems across Southern Arizona and even across the basin and range, these are the types of time scales that we see for natural replenishment of these aquifer systems. So this has been in the news quite a bit and even in the scientific literature, the concept that we're pumping fossil groundwater and that this is unsustainable. Again, because the, th the thinking is that this groundwater was recharged thousands to tens of thousands of years, years ago when the climate was different than it is today. So my colleagues and I 
<laughs> grappled with this issue because I have to admit when I started at U of A, I thought that this was the issue. I thought that the biggest problem was that we were extracting fossil groundwater and that that fossil groundwater could not be replenished on human timescales. I've since come to recognize that it doesn't necessarily matter how old the groundwater is in terms of sustainability. So let me try to paint that picture for you with this conceptual figure and a commentary we published last year. So what I wanna argue is that no matter the age of groundwater, we are extracting it at far faster rates than it will ever be naturally replenished. And that if you're extracting young water or old water, both of those cases can lead to drawdown or cones of depression or lowering of the water table that can dry out shallow wells. So again, the take home message is that we're extracting groundwater, whether we're extracting it close to the recharge area or down gradient at such high rates that we are lowering the water table and causing, again, potential drying out of shallow wells. And many of the cases in Southern Arizona, and again, in, in similar semi-arid large aquifer systems, the reason why groundwater is fossil is because it's part of a very large aquifer system. And so one might argue that you shouldn't pump out in the center of the basin and extract fossil water, that that's somehow less sustainable than extracting water near the recharge area. And I would again argue that extraction of any of this water is leading to large drawdowns of the water table and things like disconnection from surface flows, land subsidence and drying of wells. So to exacerbate this problem, as we all know, um, in the midst of climate change in the Southwest projections are suggesting that recharge to groundwater naturally is likely to decline. And so again, this is just on top of the human component, although our climate change is also an additional human component, but all of these factors are leading to declines in our regional water table. So thinking about, again, trying to get back to this issue of how deep can we drill if the surface of groundwater is going down, can we chase it? Can we go deeper and deeper? Again, the surface of groundwater going down because of climate change and drought with less recharge, over pumping of groundwater. And then in addition, which I won't talk too much about is the water quality issue of contamination. So for example, contamination from nitrates from agriculture. So there was a really interesting study that came out about two years ago where they showed that across the United States, this pattern of drilling deeper for groundwater as your surface of groundwater goes down or is contaminated is a real phenomenon. And so it's something that we think about anecdotally, but they've been able to actually be able to quantify that. So every red and orange dot across the United States represents a region where groundwater wells are getting deeper over the last, between the period of 2000 to 2015. And we can see that across much of the state of Arizona. And so again, trying to get to how deep can we drill for groundwater? So what are the limits to the bottom um, of groundwater? So I, I contacted Deborah Perone as a professor at UC Santa Barbara, because she has these beautiful pictures of what that bottom of groundwater might look like and what controls that. So one of the first limits of groundwater is the salinity issue or the water quality. So in general, as you go down with depth, salinity tends to increase. And I'll show you that that's not the case necessarily in the state of Arizona, but it is in the aquifer systems worldwide. And so your zone of fresh water is closest to the surface. You reach a brackish zone. And at some point, the salinity becomes so high that that water is not even usable for agriculture and probably doesn't make energy or economic sense to try to desalinate. The other limit to groundwater is what we call a low permeability zone, where at some point the rock um, has so little water in it that it doesn't make, again, doesn't make economic sense to be able to extract that water. There's just enough, not enough volume of water or ability of that water to flow to the well. And so you could think about that conceptually as a, either hard bedrock, or you could think of it as a 
in some cases a clay confining it. So that could be the bottom of groundwater. In addition to this, this doesn't take into account all the socioeconomic factors. So the cost of drilling deep wells. So it's no surprise in the state of Arizona, the deepest wells are for the, the large agricultural operations because those are the people that have the money to drill the deepest wells. So we see lots of examples from places like the Central Valley, California, where the poor population is losing on this battle um, for getting those deeper groundwater resources. And another example where um, regions have already reached the limit of groundwater in some cases or are rapidly approaching it. Again, this is from Deborah Perone's work and Scott DeShecco, and they show throughout central Great Plains, the Midwestern US, um, which is also the Ogallala Aquifer, that everything in red is a well that is approaching the limit of groundwater. So these are wells that are less than 20 meters from the base of the aquifer. And so in places like um, Northwestern Texas and Eastern New Mexico, your zone of aquifer system is relatively thin and you've got hard bedrock located pretty close to the surface. So to try to look at this issue, you know, at a larger continental scale, um, my colleagues and I published a paper now two years ago where we looked across the United States and we looked at the quality of the groundwater. I'm first gonna show you the depth of freshwater and then I'll show you brackish water. And so um, if we look at places in the Eastern part of the United States, like around what we call the Illinois basin or the Michigan basin, so those, those states, we can see colors of red, which represent that zone of fresh water is really thin and is close to the surface. Mm -hmm. and, and so those places, the reason for that really has to do with the local geology and its geological history. So in these places, it has pretty flat topography. So you don't get very deep fresh water flow and you've got salts and saline fluids close to the surface, again, because of their geological history. In the Western US, which is what I'll focus on, we can see in the basin and range aquifer system and in the Great Basin, we've got relatively deep freshwater systems in part because of that geological history. We have thick alluvial basins, goes beyond 10,000 feet in some cases. In many of those basins, we don't have saline fluids at depth. In some cases, like near Eloy, we've got salts at depth. So there will be local salinity increases, which I'll show you. But in general, we have relatively deep fresh water in the Western US. If we turn to look at brackish water, that's really important to consider because brackish water is already being used as a water supply um, for several different purposes. Um, one that I'll highlight is related to oil and gas production. Um, we're also using brackish water in some cases for agriculture. It could be desalinated um, to be used as a freshwater resource. And again, in the Western US, we've got relatively deep um, brackish water. It's really important again to give that local perspective because what I just showed you was really a broad brush and it basically said there's fresh and brackish water everywhere. But we know, for example, in the state of Arizona, there's, there's spatial variation or heterogeneity. And so I'll just highlight three examples. One is related to hydrothermal um, discharge. We've got another is related to um, closed basins like Cox Basin and the Wilcox Playa, where actually the most saline water is right by the surface and you get fresher water with depth. And then in large evaporative areas like the whole Gila River system, we know that there's brackish to saline water associated with that. So don't wanna paint the picture, there's fresh water everywhere in Arizona, but um, relatively we've got more fresh water deeper than other parts of the country. So to try to bring these two things together of the quality of the groundwater with depth, with the depth of wells, what we did is we looked at the current depth of wells um, relative to these factors. And what's shown in blue is the depth of water wells um, throughout these different regions um, of the US. And I'm just gonna highlight two end members. So let's go back to the Michigan Basin. It's actually where I got my PhD. The Michigan Basin, again, is a bowl of salt at depth. And so you've got a really thin freshwater lens. 
And what I wanted to highlight is that existing water wells are approaching that limit of fresh water, which is shown in purple. And so in a case like Michigan, you wouldn't have much of an opportunity to drill deeper because you'd hit this limit of salinity. Where if we look really broad brush across the basin and range, again, because of this deep depth of fresh water, we potentially in some areas have the opportunity for going deeper for fresh water. Again, only looking at the water quality issue and not the permeability or transmissivity issue or even the socioeconomic factors. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to put in one slide to, to try to draw attention to, it's not just salinity, there's all sorts of chemical constituents naturally occurring in groundwater that could impact things like irrigated agriculture. So for example, in the Central Valley of California, Mary Kang, um, who's now a professor at McGill, has shown that, for example, boron concentrations get really high in these brackish groundwater sources, and boron can impact agriculture. So there's additional factors that need to be considered. So moving to the competition issue. So you could think of it as we're having to go deeper for groundwater, but there's somebody else already using that deep groundwater and that's the oil and gas industry as well as in some cases mining. And so that's the picture I'm gonna try to paint. So in some locations of the US, oil and gas activity is really deep. So for example, uh, with the Marcellus Shale, which has become very famous for hydraulic fracturing and shale gas. In that case, in the Appalachian Basin, the oil and gas activities, again, are happening, um, you know, in this case, about two kilometers beneath the surface, so about eight to 9,000 feet. And relative to where drinking water wells are, that's very close to the surface. So that interface between fresh water water supply and fracking activities is very, very large. And that's the case in, in several other basins. But I think it's also important to consider locations where oil and gas activities are already happening close to the surface and potentially happening in some cases in brackish water aquifers. And so that sets up the competition between aquifers that we might use for water supply, particularly in the future as freshwater resources are depleted and we turn to brackish water. Again, it's already being used by the oil and gas, um, oil and gas industry. And so just a couple examples. For example, in the Michigan basin, there's a very shallow um, shale gas play called the Antrim shale that's pretty close to the surface. Um, I'll just focus on the Powder River basin which is located in Wyoming and Montana. There it's a coal bed, which is the shallowest um, natural gas activity. And ground, the coal is actually considered an aquifer in that part of the US. And that aquifer contains fresh to brackish groundwater. And so it's already being pumped out. Um, I actually talked to an operator this week who said that they're then, they used to have to store the water and it would infiltrate. Now they're discharging it into local rivers. So it's depleting that groundwater to produce oil and gas. So, and just to try to drive this point home, this is a picture showing every red dot across the US is an oil and gas well that is producing brackish groundwater. So at least from my field, we often think about oil and gas activities with dirty water, with saline water, but there are cases where oil and gas activities are already using brackish water resources which again, we might have to turn to or are already using in some water depleted regions. And the final point I'll make about this is that um, in addition to the production of brackish water with oil and gas activities, we are also using these aquifer systems for storage as well as for storage of waste products. And so somebody brought up the question of storage in the very beginning when we were just um, welcoming, welcoming folks, this is an example of that. So what it's showing you is every dot here is an exempt aquifer system. So what that means is that the EPA has said to an industry, you can use this aquifer system for your purposes. And usually what that's related to is disposal of produced waters that are often more saline, that are produced from deep oil and gas reservoirs, and they're being re-injected. Again, because the quality of the water is so poor, you can't release it at the surface. And so they re-inject it into a permeable aquifer system. 
In some cases, this is related to what's called enhanced oil recovery. Um, as we're depleting oil and trying to get more out of the ground still in some cases, and then related to mining in some instances, where again, you're injecting some fluid, whether it's acid to release things like copper or uranium. So there's activities happening already in these aquifer systems that may be out of sight, out of mind to us. And I think it's an important point to consider as we might be turning to these aquifers that they're already being used in many cases. And so um, I flew through that because I wanted to, to end with discussion. So I'll just end with this conceptual figure that hopefully drives home some of these points. So thinking about the blue as being our zone of fresh groundwater, increasing salinity to brackish, and eventually reaching this limit that groundwater is of such poor quality that we would most likely never use it for drinking water. And the idea that there's top-down competition, um, particularly between, for example, irrigated agriculture, which often has the deepest, most expensive straws into the subsurface that is rapidly depleting um, groundwater from the top down, to the effects of climate change, to then this bottom-up competition, which is really coming from, again, from industrial uses of the subsurface even to thinking about using the subsurface in a more environmental way, if you can think about it in terms of storage of carbon dioxide or storage of alternative energies. You know, we have lots of plans um, or current ways that we're using the subsurface. So I've called it this, I'm sure somebody else called it this before, but I've been calling it lately a subsurface porosity race. So porosity, thinking about it in terms of groundwater. And again, finally, I hope the take home message about what is the depth of groundwater or usable water really comes down to these three factors. First is what is the local hydrogeology in terms of what's the, the subsurface architecture that, that allows for water both to be present and to flow as well as the quality of that water. And that often comes back to the geological history. The socioeconomic conditions, which is definitely not my area of expertise, but I think important really to draw out because again, it's, it's often who, who has the most money, at least in unregulated parts um, of Arizona and other parts of the US. And then finally, who's already using that water at depth. So again, I'm, I'm sure I flew through that and I'm it looks like we've got about a half an hour left and I was really hoping to open it up for discussion. I'd love to hear from any of the policy makers or people that are more on the ground of what's happening with groundwater in the state of Arizona. Um, again, happy to answer any questions and hopefully that sparks some discussion. Wow, yes, it should. And uh, it's a very frightening um, portrait because I think many people think that the groundwater is virtually limitless. Most of us know that it hasn't been or isn't, but uh, when, when I come, I, as I come away from your talk, Jen, uh, it's worse than I thought it was because there is so much water in your slides that is either brackish or saline, which poses enormous problems for using that water for uh, for human use, so that's that's quite frightening. On, I, I have one comment, then see if we can get some others into it. Um, so the deepest wells, the biggest deepest wells, are the, the ones with the biggest capacity to pump, the biggest pump, um, are large. To, for my purposes, a large ag, and they're not immune from this because the depth of water is a big constraint on what crops you can grow uh, beyond the cost of the enormous pumps and the drilling of uh, 1,000 or 1,500 feet wells, um, just the, the heaviness of water, you know, a cubic foot of water weighs 60 pounds. And if you're bringing up thousands of gallons a minute in these big ag wells, um, you're looking at electric bills in the thousands of dollars for every well every month. And you better be growing something that's pretty darn 
uh, worthy of that, that will produce enough income for you to justify that kind of investment. And we're really already, I mean, it's good news and bad news. We're really almost at that limit for mm -hmm. lots of ag wells. The good news, that's the bad news. The good news is that that frees up water for the urban sector, which uses only a fraction of the water that the ag sector uses. So, you know, a friend, a lawyer friend in Phoenix once said, we don't have to buy out the farmers. We just have to watch them self-destruct. You take, take Pinal County, I mean, they're going back on wells and in a very short time, they're gonna reduce that water table and they will have no economic ability to use that productively. It's just the depth of water is just too costly. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, which then makes me think, and I'll stop sharing so, so we can all see each other's faces, um, is basically how deep will they lower the water table before they leave? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and who can you? But for the cities, it's just a cost of doing business, right? I mean, if you, you know, so it adds a hundred bucks uh, an acre foot for the cost to the municipal sector, that's something they can pretty easily absorb. So uh, it may be that if the farming community doesn't get together and understand that they're creating their own path to self-destruction, that um, it'll get worse for them and, and bad for us because you know, we need them to be producing more food, not less food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any questions or comments for Jen, please just jump in. I'm not gonna look at the chat. I can't read it anyway. And whenever I do, it says something like from Tony Massaro, I agree with, uh, with John. Okay, well, I, so, so I, I'm not gonna go there. So jump in or raise your hand and let's get it going. Looks like Mark has a comment or question. I'm just, I'm interested if any of the early conversations uh, about Biden administration policy on both oil and gas subsidies and the transition to <laughs> energy and sort of if there's been any early work or beginning to think about what over a 30 year time frame should those policies be implemented, what the implications would be for, for water use and it's particularly in fracking in the oil and gas sector, right? I mean, yeah, so I have been involved because um, a lot of my research has been related to environmental contamination and fracking and oil and gas. Um, long story short, um, if, at least from a water quantity perspective, um, a lot I would argue that agriculture uses a lot more water than than fracking. But um, again, a lot of these fracking activities are happening deeper. And as we deplete groundwater and that pie gets smaller and smaller, we do need to consider the oil and gas industry and its impact on water that we might end up using. So I'm saying right now, the first part of the pie is agriculture compared to the oil and gas industry, but we shouldn't forget about this component and also the legacy effects. So as we move off of fossil fuels, you know, a lot of that um, pressurization of aquifer systems and leaky well bores from abandoned wells, all sorts of issues really come to a head and, and we're starting to see this in, in old oil and gas fields. Kind of even though they've been turned off, there's a legacy effect. I, I, Jennifer, I appreciate the big picture uh, perspective, uh, but my interest is specifically in metropolitan Tucson. And I'm curious about your thoughts on the potential to manage the main aquifer in Tucson as a large scale so storage system. Yeah, that's a great question. I think Tucson Water has been pretty forward thinking in doing that already. And so it seems successful in the sense of, you know, again, being able to use treated effluent or our Colorado River water to basically buoy up the, our groundwater pool. Um, there have been, and they're, and they're again, planning to do more of that with a second injection site happening right now. Um, with the idea that you inject treated water and then it pushes the natural groundwater um, in the regional system and, and increases the water table. 
Um, my one concern about that is what are called emergent contaminants and what we've seen what has happened along the Santa Cruz and it was what has happened with Marana's water supply. And so, for example, with the PFOS issue, um, you know, we investigated this recently. And I guess the short of it is that if you treat wastewater, you can make it, you know, relatively clean and, and even potable. And we are then infiltrating that into the Santa Cruz, which can then can be pumped out downstream. Um, and that's a great solution um, because we're so lim you know, we're limited in water close to the surface um, in arid regions. But one of the implications of that are potential contaminants that we haven't thought to look for, or we just recently started looking for. And we see that, for example, with the PFOS, the early wastewater treatment plant in Tucson didn't remove it. And so it's trapped now in the Veda zone because of a, our storing of that treated wastewater. The, um, you're talking about exclusively I can just uh, come up on the, uh, the recharge of effluent. I'm specifically interested in widespread uh, recharge of rainwater. And that's a, it would occur in different places, whereas our landfills tend to be in the recharge zones that we're currently using. Yeah. Um, so this is going to be, you know, not super quantitative and more, more my gut feeling about it. Um, I, I think I know where you're headed about basically if we have more permeable surfaces and we collect our rainwater and we infiltrate it, you know, we should be doing all of those things. Um, I, and what we've seen from, from some of those efforts has been focused recharge, like along the Rito where our rainwater is essentially already collected from the city along all of our paved surfaces. And so we do see enhanced recharge in the Rito uh, because of those urban activities. My sense is that we are not going to be able to recharge the aquifer system at the rate that you would need to balance the amount of groundwater extraction. Jennifer, um, are there other parts of the world that have done things that um, you regard as beneficial and that we might learn something from? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that, well, there are regions as I'd say two things. One is this issue of recycling our water locally and using it to store, you know, for groundwater and to raise our local water tables. I think um, doing that in Tucson has made us a success story. Mm -hmm. Part of that has been from the Colorado River water and part of that has been from treated mm -hmm. effluent. And so that's why we haven't seen large scale declines locally. Um, again, I think that's been pretty forward thinking. Um, the, other, the other aspect is this conversion from agriculture with high water demand to, for example, development, um, which I've seen in Arizona. Um, and we, as Robert alluded to, might see more in the future. So as, you know, as agriculture migrates um, to potentially to wetter climates. Hmm. I was thinking of other, con uh, other countries. I mean, uh, in Israel, for example, uses a lot of hydro agriculture because their, their water is so short. And I was just wondering if there are other places that you know something about that we might take some lessons from. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know so much from the culture side, and I'm sure there's lots of innovations on that side. Um, from types of water use to water efficiency, that's really not my expertise. I know in places like Israel, you know, desalinating seawater or desalinating brackish water, you know, is an important water source. don't necessarily see us having to do that in a lot of um, southern Arizona because again we do have relatively deep freshwater resources but there are parts of Arizona um, like in northeastern Arizona where brackish groundwater is close to the surface and that is the water supply and needs to be desalinated. Yeah Michael. Uh -huh. 
Hi, how are you? I'm a historian on campus. I have a question for you. Sure. Um, would you would you say that your research that you presented today uh, is illustrative of a broader scholarly or scientific consensus about groundwater? And if so, which groups, uh, state, local, state, federal policymakers, or private enterprise, which are the ones that sort of push back the most on wanting to hear about that consensus? Hmm. <laughs> That's a great philosophical question. Um, huh. That's a good question. You know, I, I'm not sure that I'm tied in so much to, I think I have a sense of who would push back, um, but I, I think I do a good job of maybe not reading the comments on my newspaper articles for that reason. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that, that I'm real tied in, but I think, let me give you one example that I just read um, because it's just such an interesting case to me is Cochise County area. So here again, you've got this competition between large, large agriculture, you've got the state politics, and then you've got the local homeowners and local farmers who are wanting to regulate groundwater and wanting to develop something like an active management area. But even recently that getting shot down at the state level. And so why is that? You know, that's really not my area of expertise. I'm sure lots of other people online have a better sense of that. But to me, that's like a real example of some group pushing back on wanting regulation for groundwater. I can, I can try a piece of that. Uh, in 1980, the rural areas wanted no part of the Arizona Groundwater Management Act. State regulation, bugaboo, bad stuff. Uh, and they've come to rue that day. And uh, increasingly as, as people from California, big ag from the Central Valley has moved to Arizona, rural Arizona, because the rules are so um, permissive, what you're seeing is like Noah's piece in the times about the water, water wars of Arizona. And you're starting to see some rural areas say, we really need more regulation, more protection. And that includes not just groundwater, but also surface water. And there've been some stories lately, some of you I expect are familiar with about, about uh, moving water from the Colorado River main stem over to Queen Creek and other suburbs in Phoenix. And you're seeing tremendous resistance on, um, on the part of the communities along the Colorado River. Jen, can you say a word or two about um, how you determine, how do hyd hydrologists determine that water is saline or brackish as opposed to fresh? I mean, I, it can't be the cloud, uh, the gray, tele uh, gray satellite stuff, and, and, and much turns on where you set these layers, right? Yeah, that's a really good can you, question. Because, can you speak because... to that a bit? Yeah, sure. I think you're also kind of alluding to the fact that our windows and the subsurface are really few and far between. And, and al along that point, we know relatively little about our deep resources in Arizona because we don't have deep windows. So usually you get that, say, from the oil and gas industry when they drill wells. Mm -hmm. So when you drill a well, you know, they do some geophysical surveys that allow you to look at you can back out what the city profile is, but because we're not a big oil and gas state, we don't have many of these deep wells. And so we don't have a lot of pinpricks deep beneath the Tucson Basin, for example. So it's a challenge. So the way that we do that um, is again, either through geophysics, but the way that my group does it is through just sampling water wells or compiling previous data. And so not a perfect science. As you described, we only have a few windows into the subsurface. And so that may be five deep wells within a whole county beyond you know, thousands of feet depth. And so we know, we know the thickness of sediments in general. We know the depth to bedrock. So we know we have deep aquifer systems and the few deep wells that have been characterized for their salinity. We know that there's relatively fresh water with depth but that picture is really vague. Mm -hmm. And again, it's whoever has the money to do that kind of thing. Scientists don't have the money to do this, you know, deep drilling, cost a million dollars. Um, and so it's usually industry driven. 
And we haven't had the kinds of industry that cared about deep groundwater in Southern Arizona to characterize it. Thanks. Other questions? Trace, circle back to you. Saw your hand up a minute ago. Uh, your voice is turned off. <laughs> okay. Uh, other questions? We've got a few more minutes. Other questions for Jen? Well, maybe I can ask a question of you, Robert, or anybody else who's an expert, because I was really hoping to, to hear the latest on, um, again, the Groundwater Management Act in Arizona or what's been happening more at a legislative level, level if you have any idea. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, um, I think the act has generally been understood to be a success. Um, there were some changes to it in the 90s that let developers do end runs around complying with the assured water supply provisions. They basically created this, this thing, the Central Arizona uh, Replenishment District, and developers could simply say, okay, my land is now in the district, and that district then has an obligation to find renewable supplies. Uh, and that went on and on, especially in Maricopa. And eventually, um, well, by the time people awoke to what was going on, the obligation of the replenishment district, ex district exceeded the entire CAP allocation for the city of Tucson. So now you're having municipal people all looking at the same pot of water to try to, to you know, provide for, for future, future growth. That was, that was uh, I think, a big mistake. The, um, you mentioned, Jan, the, uh, the drought contingency plans, and those no doubt uh, were very successful. That's not groundwater, that's really surface water, the Colorado River, but that's been awfully important. Um, I'll just make two quick points on that, which is, one is it's amazing that it was done, three points. Two, it was done by water marketing under another name. They're called water exchanges, dry year lease options, uh, aug augmentation supply issues, but not water marketing, because that's kind of the, the, the dirty word. And, uh, and three, the players who made that happen were the Gila River Indian community and the Colorado River Indian tribes. Mm -hmm. And it was they, those two groups who put the water on the table to make it happen. And that is the first time in my memory that tribes have controlled something as serious as the level in Lake Mead, which leads to cut, cutoffs for the entire state. So you're seeing a level of interest in Indian communities in participating in transfers that they control. And so they're monetizing some of their water rights with, with leverage positions that that are like a bond ladder, you know, over years. Uh, it's been uh, fun to see. Mm -hmm. Okay, last couple of questions for Jen, please. Going once, like the auctioneer, going twice. Well, this is, uh, this is really scary stuff. Um, I am very grateful to you for coming here. And it, uh, uh, it's gonna take me a while to catch my breath because it, um, I hadn't thought about it, not, uh, not at all thought about uh, the, the level of salinity and the level of brackish water and how that's mixing. And, and as someone who lived in Michigan for a while, that's, that's really frightening and they're, they're you know, they're putting in, I'm sure many people know, that the problems in the West of overpumping are now going on in the Midwest. Um, there was never, in the East, there was never groundwater pumping in the East where you get 50 inches of rain a year or the Midwest, but that's been happening. I mean, there are now more than 10,000 center pivots in South Georgia all drawing on groundwater. Um, the state of Michigan has been putting in um, groundwater wells to beat the band. And those are almost like 
pre-1980 Arizona days, which is all these wells are going in and they're essentially unregulated. In, in Georgia, you don't even need a permit to drill a well unless you're going to pump more than 100,000 gal gallons of water a day. And then you need a permit and the permits are easy to come by. So, you know, the first 36 million gallons are no questions asked. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's a recipe for the tragedy of the commons. Mm -hmm. Final thoughts, please. Good turnout today, 30 people in. Yeah, it was good. People from all, all across campus, also good. Bruce Plank, you must have a comment. I never call on people, but I can always call on Bruce, old friend, lawyer, solar guy. No, you're not gonna take the bait today. Oh, there he is, yeah. Okay, 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 I'll take, uh, okay, I'll take yeah. the bait. Um, there was a question earlier about uh, lessons to be learned from other countries. And my recollection is that some of the biggest water users in the Kingman area are now Saudi Arabian cattle producers, or I, I think I've heard that. Are they using Saudi technology to, to minimize their water use or are they using good old American technology and not worrying about it? And is that something that is the, the future of foreign investors coming in from countries that have even worse uh, brackish water situations to take advantage of Arizona's relatively good water situation? Uh, I, could, I can take a crack at that. Uh, yeah, Saudi Arabia has been on the uh, on the market and they've come across and bought up farms. It's it's for uh, cattle production, but it's also for milk, you know, and it's alfalfa. So alfalfa gets a bad name for being a low value crop just to, to grow beef cattle. But uh, but people have uh, tend to overlook the fact that the other side of that is dairy products. And uh, if you like cheese and yogurt, whatnot, you're getting it from the alfalfa fed to dairy cows. And uh, so they're coming in and buying up farms and growing the alfalfa and then putting it on, on container ships and shipping it back. The biggest, the biggest one that's getting alfalfa from the US is China. It's just absolutely uh, exploded the amount of water that's embedded in alfalfa that's being sent to China. And, that, and I don't blame the farmers for doing this at all. We've made it so difficult for farmers to transfer water uh, among themselves or with other users in the United States that if they can make a buck continuing to grow alfalfa in some challenging areas that require a lot of water to do so and they can sell it to China, then that's what they're doing. We're not giving them the options to keep the water locally. Well, that's um, about it for our hour. Uh, Jen, you know, just a wonderful job. I can't thank you enough. Um, I'll stay around for as long as people would like. Maybe Jen has a few more minutes to, to interact with some of you as well. So thank you all for showing up and uh, uh, be safe, be well. Thanks, everybody. Okay, it looks like a few people are hanging around. Uh, anyone want to start the discussion? Carol. It's not exactly a discussion. It's just a question about oil and uh, gas and the fracking reinjection. It sounded to me from your talk as if the brackish water, one of its functions is to hold up the fresh water. Uh, and I was thinking about the, the brackish water, if the oil and gas industry is pushing brackish water down in, and there's less pumping of fresh water, it seemed to me like this is not so much of a problem, except insofar as it's pollutants that would get then uh, infiltrated into the fresh water. But the brackish water could actually act as a support for the fresh water lens. Um, I, I guess this is why I'm thinking the big problem is agriculture, is just sucking up all of, the, all of the water. And Robert, with respect to what you're saying, that alfalfa goes to China, but nobody's paying for the water. And, and as you know, there's, there's a problem with that, but that's a, that's a different issue. But can you say a little bit more about, is there a way in which fracking, brackish reinjection or other kinds of reinjections of brackish water might actually not be so harmful, but rather hold up a, the, the, a, a freshwater lens so that it's, it's more available? 
Yeah, that that's a good, good question. Um, I guess I would first start to say that, that I understand why you think about that conceptually, that as you remove water, you know, from depth, that that the water above that would sink. But I would, I would say that the subsurface is, is not that simple. There are areas what we call under pressure. So if you remove water from depth, it doesn't necessarily mean that the water table is gonna go down. Um, hmm. And then the point that I was trying to make is that there are locations again where either brackish water is being produced um, and then discharged into streams, so taken out of storage. Yeah. Right. So, so if we could be using that in the future, it's already being taken out of storage and discharged into streams. And then the third point was about the areas where things are being injected for whether it's again copper mining. You know, there's a great example happening in Arizona right now. You know, so as you move to things like in situ recovery of minerals and you're injecting chemicals, which is not necessarily harmful, but then could potentially be releasing things like copper, you're already using that aquifer system in a way that we then wouldn't extract that water for drinking water supply. And so these issues are gonna become more to a head as local freshwater supplies are depleted. So they may not be an issue right now, but moving into the future, my point is that you know there's already people using those aquifers for different purposes and so far that's been a relatively unregulated business in the sense that again it's been more thought to be you know things industrial uses of these deep water supplies but as we approach that these issues will become more more apparent one of these issues i'm concerned about is the ability to reusably store water in the aquifer. And so the subsidence uh, becomes a real big issue there. Do we know anything about how reusable <laughs> the aquifer might be? Yeah, once you squeeze out that, wring out that sponge, Mm -hmm. and it doesn't go back to its initial condition. Um, I would say that's definitely not my area of expertise. So I don't want to, you know, I can't tell you we'll lose 20% of our capacity, mm -hmm. for example, in the Tucson Basin. Um, and part of it is getting that water to the aquifer. And so that's why these locations of focused recharge are so important because take the Santa Cruz. So there's been plenty of studies by Tom Meixner in our department and others, USGS, that show that you really have to have a wetted surface to be able to get that water to the water table because our water table is so deep. So that's why when you first asked about rainwater and using it locally, if you've just got what's called diffuse recharge from you know, all these homeowners with permeable surfaces and water cisterns and watering their plants, my sense is from, from studies in Tucson that that water would just go right back to the atmosphere. It'd be used by the plants or it'd be evaporated within the soils. So that's why you really need these areas of focused recharge. So Evan the Can pond, yeah. the, the streams. Evan Canfield uh, sent me a, a study that was done here several decades ago about the uh, level of isotope, I think the tritium, uh, that indicated that basically no surface recharge from surface in the mid basin. But yeah. Phoenix has approximately 70,000 uh, dry wells. Our proportion would be about 10 or 15,000 dry wells, which is equivalent to a drought well every few blocks of residential area. And so at a considerable expense, we could store 10, uh, probably 10 billion gallons a year with a network of dry wells. So mm -hmm. that becomes a, an issue of can we do that safely? And is it re something that's reusable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's an interesting 
And it sounds like your source of what you're proposing would be rainwater, right? Which then leads to all the, the issues with climate change and deep winter precipitation and more flashy summer precipitation and beyond my area of expertise. But so it sounds like you're proposing to capture rainwater and then inject it in the wells. Yeah, so I would say from a subsurface storage capacity, we have a lot of potential. And again, we're already doing that in Tucson using treated effluent or using Colorado River water. The, the, yeah, I think- talk about water harvesting at all uh, claims that uh, when you harvest water, you're taking water out of the surface water system. Uh, and that's, that's a- yeah. uh, an interference with uh, senior prior appropriation rights. But the problem is that, uh, as Jen says, there's actually more water to be collected when you have a bunch of uh, streets and, and driveways and rooftops. You've got impermeable surfaces and it runs off and you could possibly collect it. Um, it's still rain, but it would require quite a collection system. And I don't think, I don't think um, Trace, the there are many of those wells that, that are would be available for the for the direct recharge. That's why recharge in the city area. That's why we're using stream beds, which is which are much more porous and permeable and better um, better vehicles for trying to recharge. But the problem the problem there is that the recharge that we've been doing is typically in the northwest side, and the water flow is continuing to go northwest. And all of a sudden, it's not in Tucson. So, uh, what we need to do, uh, so, you know, Marana says, you know, oh, well done, you know, we're going to send you a Christmas card. But uh, uh, what we really need to be doing is figuring out ways to put in uh, treatment and recharge facilities southeast, say, uh, in the Vale area that's rapidly growing. So, keep water local, right? That's the slogan, mm -hmm. keep water local. And if we had a treatment plant there, then we could use it for. Uh, the reclaimed water, you know, or we could start to recharge it in basins or, you know, the, the, some of the washes out there. Mm -hmm. well, I think it's time to end our, our session. Jen, do you have a final comment? No, just appreciate the discussion and the opportunity. Oh, it's been Thanks. Great, great to have you. So good Pick to see you. Pick your brain for more hours. So yeah, well, hopefully I'm happy, I'm have the opportunity. To have a, a, a tea or coffee over Zoom anytime. So uh, thank you all for coming. It's been great to see you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.